السلام علیکم خواتین حضرات آئی ویلکم یو ٹو دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان وی آر پروسیڈنگ ٹو ورڈ لیکچر نمبر ایٹین آف برانڈ مینجمنٹ ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو فور آئی ول لائک ٹو گیو یو ری کیپ آف دا لاسٹ ٹو لیکچرس میننگ لیکچر نمبر سکسٹین اینڈ سیونٹین بیکاز کد وی ڈسکس اے ویری امپارٹنٹ آسپیکٹ آف برانڈ مینجمنٹ دیٹ از پوزیشننگ اینڈ آئی لائک ٹو میک شیور before I proceed further, that that concept is very clear in the minds of all of us. Needless to say, that positioning lays the foundation for all the operational strategies which are going to be at work to get the results envisaged in terms of uh, financial objectives and in terms of uh, the marketing objectives. Both objectives are very strategic in nature and positioning Don't forget the fact is the concept which really lays foundation for all that. May it be price, may it be communication strategies, all stem from the concept of positioning. A clear positioning leads us toward implementation of all the strategic framework that we have developed or are going to develop to achieve our goals. What we discussed in the previous lectures about positioning was that it started back in 1950s and that was the era of uh, product. Experts call it product era. Technologies that were coming into being in an advanced manner which gave rise to so many new products with new features, meaning differentiated features and most of the manufacturers were talking about the unique selling propositions which basically stemmed from the differentiated features their products or their brands had. So that was a time when people were talking about USPs, meaning unique selling propositions. Communication was at a very high level because they all had to talk about differentiation that their brands were carrying. The product era came to an end when technologies reached a certain level, meaning access to technologies, various technologies by various manufacturers became easy and most of the manufacturers were producing products which are very similar in nature. What happened? The level of innovations dropped, but the level of communication stayed, not only stayed at the same level, it further increased. Why? Because With the drop-in differentiation, managers thought that uh, they could find refuge in stepping up communication and uh, by doing so, they can talk uh, very frequently with uh, the target market and hence can push up their sales. It did not really happen the way they wished. So the product era came to an end and uh, it made a transition to what they call an image era. The image era was all about building up image of the brands to the managers and companies that were carrying. There was a thinking on part of uh, the advertising people. Um, if we talk about um, image, we really can build up something at the receiving end and make them go for the brand meaning to make it possible for them to be motivated into going for a sale, I mean into going for a purchase. But that did not really work because of the problem that I discussed in the previous lecture and also even before that, that image is not something which you can develop, which you can build up or you can change overnight with the help of a creative campaign. Creativity just for the sake of creating something new does not really help. So this era also came to an end, just like the product era. And since you know, this was also an era, the meaning, a period, it had to come to an end. The effect was that um, these eras graduated into new eras, which uh, witnessed even a higher level of communication. 
meaning when the image era came to an end, the level of communication was even higher than it was witnessed in the product era. It was a moment of thought for specialists, meaning for the advertising people, as to what to do. So this was a time when two advertising experts thought of the positioning concept and they thought it is something which can be done to the mind of the customers and by doing so we really can hit the jackpot and we really can uh, reach where but we really can reach the territory where people can make decisions whether to buy something or not to buy something. So the positioning era came into being. And positioning, as you will recall, is all about doing something to the mind in relation to the prior knowledge or the perceptions with which customers have in their minds. And not forgetting that perception is stronger than reality. We have to do something with those perceptions. Customers are exposed to the market. They are exposed to an array of different brands, meaning competitive brands. They are aware of the strengths and weaknesses. They go through a comparison process, meaning a process of selection, whereby they make the decisions with what to buy and what not to buy. And therefore, to facilitate the mind of the customer, the mind which they call is oversimplified. Oversimplified because it retains just a portion of what it has been receiving and rejects the remainder. So in order to reach that oversimplified mind, that we have to do something with the information and knowledge that mind already has. So the thought, let us start talking about things which really will touch the card and things which really will ring a bell in terms of the existent knowledge at the back of the mind. We also learned that uh, there are four uh, the basic um, factors which govern uh, the positioning and we are not to lose sight of those factors. Uh, the one is uh, a brand for what? The second is a brand for whom? And the third is a brand for when? And the fourth is a brand against whom? Now, these are the four factors which govern uh, the, the uh, positioning uh, process, I would say. Uh, the way it should work within uh, companies while you people are um, deciding about uh, the way to position the brand. Now, don't lose sight of the fact that uh, although positioning is something which solves a communication problem, and uh, it is all about communication uh, when it comes to uh, it being externally driven. Uh, but then at the same time, since we are trying to generate something uh, which is going to supplement the already existent knowledge in the minds of the customers, uh, we have to create something uh, at the company end, uh, meaning at the sending end, in a very tangible form, meaning the product which really matches with that communication. So in other words, communication is taking place and it is being received at this end, where the customer is, and something very tangible, which is a product or a brand, is being produced here, which is the manufacturer's end, and which is your end. So there has to be a match between the two. And knowing that, or having learned that, we defined the positioning process. And we also learned that uh, this process, or the definition of positioning, or the positioning statement, so to say, has um, uh, three fundamental components. The one deals with the overall market, meaning the category uh, in which uh, you are uh, operating uh, or the playing field of which you are a part. It deals with um, the target market, which is the, the second important component. Uh, and the target market is what you are trying to reach, uh, which is your target, and where you have your direct competitors. The third component is the point of preference. The third component is um, the point of difference, and you will recall I stressed that clarity of all these components, of all these three areas, is of paramount importance. We 
did discuss the first one, meaning clarity about the overall market, meaning the category in detail, meaning in relation to the micro aspects of what that component uh, in the previous lecture. And uh, we now get on with our uh, discussion with the remaining two components in terms of their sort of micro aspects, the things that we have to consider and study very carefully before we can decide on what should be the positioning of, of a brand. And I will keep repeating this thing, that the concept of positioning is so important uh, that we uh, just cannot live without it in the world of marketing. Uh, this is the concept which lays the ground and which lays the basic framework for all the strategies that which are going to flow to the out of the positioning. And needless to say, the positioning has got to be very closely related with uh, uh, the brand vision. Okay, then having said that, now let us get back to the second component of uh, the positioning statement, which is uh, about the target market. There are certain concerns and certain uh, questions which have to be answered and we have to raise those questions to ourselves and we have to answer those questions to ourselves in order to be very sure and convincing that we are moving in the right direction, we are on the right track. The first question that we should ask ourselves is, does the market that we are trying to reach fall within the target range? Now, this is a very pertinent question. Uh, what it means is, we may be working on a target range which is not ours. Getting back to the same good example of brand XYZ, if we think that the professionals the working in banks and other uh, professional companies are our customers and therefore the target market because uh, they are hungry at uh, the lunchtime and they don't really have time to get out of the office uh, and we are there to offer them something right at the doorstep. When we start selling, we may find out, or when we carry out the market test as a very preliminary step, we may find out to our surprise and total astonishment that the range which we thought was the target range is not the target range. Or maybe that is the target range, but another part of the segment with which you never thought that was part of the target range has turned out to be the target range. That also is a possibility. So looking at these things, you have got to continuously reassure yourself that the positioning that you have carved out for the brand is the right positioning. Now, the positioning has got to be a little flexible. Flexible in the sense that if you move um, a little leftwards on the price quality index, if you may recall uh, that um, graphic illustration, or if you move a little rightwards, the meaning in the upper segment, positioning should not be disturbed. It still should be maintainable. It still should be sustainable. Okay, the uh, next question which you should ask yourself is, do uh, the customers consider themselves as part of the target market? You may introduce something for a target market and the market may not be ready to accept that because their habits are different, their buying patterns are different, and whatever promise and the brand contract you may have, whatever picture that you have created is not compatible with the market which uh, we think is the target market and, and customers could falling within that range do not look upon themselves as the target customers. Now this is like, uh, I mean to give you an example, this is like introducing um, an 800cc car uh, having an appeal for uh, that segment or that part of the segment, that target range which is the appropriate target for a car of 1300cc. So this may explain uh, what I'm talking about. Another question which uh, you should ask uh, yourselves is, uh, are the customers reachable? I mean, reachable not only in the sense, uh, in the physical sense, like you're delivering something or you see that you're selling something um, uh, through the stores and they may come there. Are they reachable through communication also? If you are selling something to farmers, for example, 
and you don't really have uh, the level of requisite communication with which you should have in order to reach them, then I think the dialogue between the manufacturer or the brand manager and the prospective customer is going to be difficult, if not outright impossible. So you've got to be very clear about whether or not the target market is reachable. Another question that uh, you may ask yourself, uh, will the target market be interested in the point of difference? I'm talking about the point of difference in relation to the target market, whereas I'm going to talk about the point of difference also in relation to the point of difference as one of the major components. Now you might think to yourselves, that I'm talking about things you know, which may belong here and not there, but that's not the point. The important point is these are all links. These are all building blocks. They all have so closely related relationships and so closely related links that uh, they've got to be talked as part of uh, an overall integrated thing, an overall integrated concept where, like I told you earlier, all these converge at one single point. And that is a point where you produce the product or the brand with those differentiated features for which the whole company is striving or for which the whole company is working day in and day out. If customers, meaning the target customers, are not willing to uh, accept that point of difference, the point of difference is no good. Just to give you another example relating to the car industry, I would say this is like um, laddering up a car model in terms of very attractive attributes which may have their benefits translated in terms of very high comfort and luxury and targeting, and, and targeting that car to the customers who basically are economy oriented. They keep thinking all the time that consumption has got to be improved by the manufacturers. And if it cannot be improved, we might as well go for an added feature on our own, meaning we should go for um, a fitting of the CNG kit, I mean the natural gas kit. Whereas we are adding features in terms of luxury and comfort, which do not really have a very strong appeal for the target market. So the point of difference that we create has got to be understood, appreciated, and owned and accepted by the target market. Another question that uh, must be asked to ourselves is, why has the target market not been approached before by anyone else? This is a very heavyweight question because this opens uh, the avenues to a, a, a very long thought process. Why is it that competitors could have not introduced this kind of a feature or this kind of a product before? Is it because of certain entry barriers? And entry barriers relate to, uh, like I told you, the amount of resources or the nature of resources which a company requires in order to be able to deliver the promise or in order to be able to deliver uh, the feature with which the company is contemplating about positioning the brand. Maybe it requires a very high amount of investment and if it is that, are we ready for that? Or maybe it requires a kind of human resource with which is very scarce to find. Uh, are we in a position to have those kind of people um, uh, operatives who can, can handle our product in a way that um, we can own the positioning of the product or the brand? So this is a very heavyweight question which must be answered. Well, that's about uh, the clarity that we should have and we should develop in relation to uh, the target market. And um, uh, let us now make transition to the third component uh, which is equally important, uh, another fundamental component with which um, calls for clarity about the point of difference. The first question that we must ask ourselves is about the key benefit. Is it really important to customers? I mean, if the key benefit is like the health food, 
Is it really important to them? I mean, the kind of target market that we are trying to reach, are they really concerned about uh, their health? Or maybe they are young enough not to care about that. If the target market is like people with between 45 and 65, for example, or 45 years and above, but maybe the key benefit is going to be important to those people. And if the target market is like below 45, and also it goes even lower, the down to 30s, then maybe the, the key benefit that we are talking about, or on which we want to position our product, it may not be just about the right thing to talk about in terms of positioning. The second question that we should ask ourselves is, can we really deliver it? Now, this takes us to the, back to the brand contract and the brand promise. I mean, the set of promises that we have for our brand. In relation to positioning also, we have to ask ourselves this question. Now, let me make it clear all over again. When we are talking about the brand promise, or we are building those promises into the product or the brand and working on the brand contract. It doesn't mean that we are not working simultaneously also on positioning. As a matter of fact, we are talking about all these things and we are, we are considering and studying all these factors all at the same time. This may sound rather tricky and a little difficult to you people because you are trying to imbibe whatever I'm talking about and it is a learning process because where you've just uh, started to begin learning but the fact is that you will get used to all these things uh, pretty quickly once you enter the practical field coming back to the level of preparedness that you must have in order to enter the practical field uh, let me assure you that all these concepts are going to be considered um, simultaneously all at the same time, you're talking about the promise and then you're asking yourself uh, or discussing among colleagues that, uh, well, this is a promise which we may not be in a position to deliver because we have certain operation, operational constraints. Or you, you may ask yourself, um, this is a promise which uh, cannot be delivered because it is very difficult in terms of uh, uh, delivering the product the way that we are talking about that even if we grow, beyond a certain point, we shall still uh, keep uh, our model of selling through this direct delivery, meaning reaching the doorstep of each and every customer. You may think to yourself that uh, the, the point is not that far, but when you start putting up um, your restaurants, and uh, when you have done that, uh, it is going to be a combination of delivery at the doorstep and also selling at your shops, meaning at your stores or small utility restaurants. When you're doing that, there's going to be a little change in the delivery. So the question is whether you are going to be in a position to deliver at all or not. And number two part of the question is, even if you can, what are going to be the changes? The implied changes have got to be taken into consideration before you answer to yourselves this kind of a question. So in other words, there should not be any elements of wishes involved in the considerations or involved in relation to answering this pertinent question, which has to be taken very seriously, whether you can do something or not. If you can, very good. If you cannot, then don't do it. I mean, do it in some other way. The third question which you should ask yourself is, uh, can we sustain this point of difference over time? I mean, if point of difference is very trivial, not very serious, and can be uh, copied by competitors, maybe you know, we are not going to be in a position to sustain this. And you know, this might take us back to the product era I was talking about. Uh, where technology levels, you know, came to a point uh, where everybody started producing the same thing and the same is happening nowadays. I mean, look at the technologies, how easy it is to acquire different technologies and uh, start producing things which are very similar to what is being made next door, for example. And still, you have to find a point of difference. Let us 
concentrate on the point of difference and take a talk about our ability or inability to sustain that point of difference. So one uh, consideration could be uh, the non-serious or very trivial nature of the point of difference. The other could be a very serious aspect and that may be that the point of difference requires over a longer period very heavy investment because it is a vision and your vision is that this point of difference has got to be innovated and has got to be evolved with the changing needs and expectations. So what is it, see, what I'm going to do when I'm here? Changing the product and yet keeping it, yet keeping the identity of it the same. Giving the customer the uh, practical demonstration of uh, a changed or a laddered up benefit and yet giving him or her the same brand they love. So being able to sustain or not be, being able to sustain the point of difference is something that has to be uh, taken into a very strong consideration while you are studying the positioning aspect. Um, another question that you might uh, consider, or rather you should consider is, can we further fortify the point of difference? Well, this is an extension of uh, what I already have talked about, uh, that I talked about improving the brand somewhere down the line. And if you think you really can fortify it and further strengthen it, um, well, you should be very clear about that because uh, the fortifying it is going to have its implications in terms of uh, investments. Again, investments into plant and machinery, equipment, investment into human resource, investment into information systems, or investment into marketing systems in terms of distribution, logistics, and warehousing. So these are the factors which are to be considered in order to make sure that the positioning that you have carved out for the brand is going to uh, be fortified and you have the ability to fortify that. You will recall, and I keep emphasizing this point again and again, that it is positioning out of which all operational strategies flow. And if the whole game is about implementing strategies, then we've got to make sure that the positioning that we are talking about is the right positioning and it is something which can be sustained over a long period and not only sustained but can be fortified also. So having said that, the next question which is very closely related is what is the potential of the positioning we are studying or talking about um, in terms of uh, placing ourselves or placing our brand at the brand value pyramid? Does it have the potential to hit the top and be at the pinnacle? If the answer is yes, the brand is, so, is doing so well, it is moving so beautifully, it has such a tremendous following, and we have the resources uh, not only to maintain and sustain it, but also to further fortify it, and the changes, uh, the improvements uh, that we're going to uh, carry out uh, down the line are also already not only contemplated, but worked on, just like uh, the car manufacturers, motorbike manufacturers, or electronics uh, the manufacturers do. When you take a very good look at um, a car model, uh, maybe you, know, you can point out that uh, this you know, particular point, uh, right underneath the tail light, uh, seems to be a, a kind of a vacant point, which is uh, going to be used for something uh, else, something beefed up in the model to come, and that might turn out to be uh, correct. So what I'm saying is uh, the changes or the fortification uh, that you envision and you plan to carry out, many a time you put them in place and you start working on those, and if you really are in a position to do so, meaning if you really have the human resource and the technical resource to do all that, then the positioning of the brand is not only strong, 
but it is going to stay strong and strong. Look at um, uh, the campaigns kicked off by cola drinks. And when I talk about the cola drinks, uh, I'm talking about international brands, and they have been around not only decades, but uh, more than a century. And uh, the brand identity remains the same. The, the position um, remains the same. Uh, if there is a little bit of change you know, here and there, um, that does not really alter the identity you know, of the brand altogether. It did happen, by the way, in relation to one uh, the brand, uh, but uh, that is not going to be the topic of discussion right at this moment. Uh, what happened as a consequence of that is a very, very interesting case study, and uh, the company had to go back to um, the original positioning. And uh, this is uh, something which uh, I'm going to talk about right now uh, with you guys. Uh, what is going to happen when there is a change in the positioning. And what is it that causes or that should cause a change in the positioning of the brand? And how soon or, or, or how late or how frequently uh, positioning should be changed relating any brand? Because this is a continuous evolution and uh, habits are changing, people are changing, market dynamics are changing. So how do we respond in relation to changing the position of the brand, and what are the consequences of that? Let us talk about those. The question is, why at all a change is positioning should be caused? We've had the understanding about the components of uh, the positioning, the three fundamental components, but at the same time, we also know that we've got to stay current and contemporary meaning up to date, in order to respond to the changing needs. I'm relating the concept with what we already have learned. Now, when we do that, is it that positioning is going to change, or is it that positioning is not going to change? And what we are discussing at the moment is that positioning is going to change, and it is going to cause certain uh, ramifications. and. Uh, it is those ramifications that we're going to talk about. Um, let us go back to the example of uh, this uh, fast food uh, once again. Um, the company is uh, considering getting into the, uh, the area of restaurants. It does not really want to confine itself only to delivering direct at the doorstep uh, because of certain uh, the complications. Uh, maybe they started off on, on the right foot uh, by carving out uh, just about the most appropriate positioning uh, because they started talking about in their communications um, that they really specialize in um, delivering uh, at your doorstep within a specific time which is very consumer friendly uh, and which will not give you any cause for complaint. Now, that is a strong position which the brand developed to itself. Now, we are talking about staying current in terms of uh, meeting the growth aspect. But we are growing and uh, we think that the only way to grow is that we start putting up restaurants because there is a limitation to the concept of delivering the way that we have been delivering because of certain operational uh, complications and limitations. Is the positioning going to change or going to stay the same? The answer could be maybe the positioning is going to change. The positioning is going to change if you've had problems with delivering direct and people started complaining and that might force you to get into another area of positioning or meaning making a shift in terms of positioning uh, and start communicating about something which is different from uh, the being very direct. You started talking about the direct delivery because you thought that was your strength and you thought that was not the strength of competition and you could really capitalize on what was the weakness of the competition. 
Now, maybe in order to be very competitive in the marketplace, your competitors um, also jump on the same bandwagon of um, direct delivery and uh, you started facing you know, the stiff competition being another factor apart from the operational uh, limitations. And you think that you should also now concentrate apart from the way you've been working on the restaurants. Now that is a place where people come and they buy. You do not go to them. Now this is not to say that you stop working direct. You can continue that mode of um, selling or that channel of delivering even through the restaurants or maybe through different restaurants which is going to provide you with a chain and which is going to improve in a way your distribution. But the fact is, what is, going to the, what is going to be the impact on positioning? So if you think, like I said earlier, if you think that it does cause a little uh, bit of shift in the positioning, then you've got to change it. Lest somebody else start talking about what you want to talk because of the existence of restaurants. With the existence of utility restaurants, which you think should not be very uh, upscale and should not be very fashionable and should give a look of very economy driven uh, where uh, the people uh, should not really hesitate with walking into it because they know the price is still very consumer friendly. The point to ponder here is what is going to be the impact um, on the positioning statement or in other words positioning of the brand. I cannot give you uh, an answer right now in absolute certainty because I have not yet talked about uh, the mechanism which you should bring into play in order to decide what positioning the company should go for. Um, once you have learned that, then I will be in a position to tell you what should be the position under what circumstances. Like if you have brought about a change from here to there in terms of the attributes. Now this is a situation in which uh, you know, you're dealing with uh, the restaurants, you're dealing with uh, the delivery of uh, your sandwiches, food items. Um, so it is a combination of uh, the product market and service market. Uh, the, the positioning is going to be uh, based on what factors, we shall talk about those a little later. Um, but um, the fact of the matter is, it is the growth process which um, has uh, made it uh, important for the company to bring about a change and then be sensitive to that change in terms of uh, uh, making the decision uh, about um, renewed positioning uh, because this entails uh, a, a different level of communication. Talking about the same restaurant, uh, if it is growing and it is getting into a chain of uh, the different uh, the outlets, then I think it becomes imperative uh, and very important that uh, the company steps up it, um, its communication campaign and start talking with its the target customers in an aggressive manner. Now, what is it the company is going to talk about in relation to positioning? That is something you know, we're going to talk about a little later uh, as to what should be the mechanism uh, which is going to be the basis of uh, that shift and the, uh, the, the positioning with which is going to be the new position of the brand. Adjusting and strengthening your position under those circumstances becomes the main real objective. It is not that you are improving your product, you are passing through a process of growth and nothing could hurt the brand more than weakening its position only because we could not handle the shift. So that's something which has to be handled very, very professionally and being very sensitive to the consequences with which a shift in positioning causes. In other words, if we manage the shift in positioning properly, that amounts to meeting growth with credibility. 
because that brings the brand credibility and it becomes more and more credible. And this is how and this is why strong brands stay strong for decades and decades because they know when to bring about a change and based on that change, uh, when and how to change positioning and what is it which really appeals uh, the target market in terms of the positioning uh, they are contemplating and in terms of uh, the communication process uh, relating uh, that positioning. We have seen that um, a shift that you know we have been talking about, of course in a very hypothetical way, it is something which is going to cause a change uh, not only in uh, strategies but also in tactics. In relation to the same restaurant or the XYZ brand that we've been talking about um, throughout um, the, the course. And it is because of that that we say that positioning has its implications um, in all the strategic areas. It is because of that that we say that all the operational strategies stem from the positioning of the brand. Now, positioning is therefore is just not a concept. It is something which governs the total strategic framework when it comes to the brand strategies and implementation of those strategies. And when we talk about those strategies and implementation of those, of course we are talking about the total operations uh, within the company. So we're not only talking about the area of brand management, because we're talking about the operations in, in, in their totality. And therefore, uh, we are not to lose sight of all the touch points of brand management. And in turn, therefore, we can say that um, a shift in positioning is going to have its implications in terms of pricing, in terms of distribution, in terms of location, uh, in terms of uh, aesthetics, and uh, in terms of investments. You are putting up restaurants. You need money to do that. You need more people. You have to have uh, a very well-trained human resource which can work as a team uh, in those uh, outlets. You may have to do something with pricing also. Although I've been talking about consumer-friendly pricing, but uh, none of us is sure so far until we really work out what is going to be the implication of the investments that we're going to make in terms of um, the uh, infrastructure and also in terms of uh, uh, the market investments, meaning communications. Maybe the implications of all that are going to be so serious that we are forced to bring about a change in the, in the pricing, for example. And if there's a change in pricing, then again the question is, uh, does that change the position of the brand or does it not? Let me tell you one thing that took the strong position, because maybe you know, we missed this point in the previous lecture. A strong position is the one uh, which um, uh, does not uh, subject itself to changes, uh, to sensitive changes uh, on the basis of uh, the very uh, you know, minor shifts. While changing the price drastically is not a minor shift, it is a major shift. But then you see the point is uh, positioning should be such that uh, bringing about uh, these uh, the kind of changes with which with one should keep in mind that while the one is developing the vision of the brand because you know that you are here and you're going to go there. So that you are uh, developing the vision and you have developed the brand picture, uh, the brand contract and so on and so forth. That you should be in a, in a very good position to uh, assess uh, whether or not these kind of shifts are going to uh, cause the very serious um, the consequences uh, for the brand positioning or will just cause minor ripples on the surface that which can be taken care of uh, by uh, the minor you know, the levels of um, you know, the stepped up communications. So these are uh, the things you know, which uh, the one really has to consider uh, while changing the position of the brand and uh, the crux of the matter is that a change in the position uh, occurs because you are continuously changing and continuously changing means uh, once every three years or once every two years 
But based on those changes, you have to stay uh, very current and very contemporary uh, in relation to all the strategic implications that those changes may have, including positioning. And positioning, needless to say, is very highly strategic. It's the mother of all strategies. I mean, this is a statement which I uh, can make with confidence. So we have talked about uh, the fundamental components of uh, uh, the positioning statement. Uh, we have talked about uh, the, the basic questions um, in the uh, micro form uh, that we should be asking ourselves uh, in order to make sure that the positioning uh, that we are uh, on our way to um, carve out for the brand is the right position. And uh, we also have talked about uh, the uh, ramifications in terms of uh, strategic changes uh, within the setup um, brought about by certain shifts in positioning here and there. Let me give you another example, which is a textbook example, and therefore I can talk about the brand with confidence. Um, the difficult situation which was caused for that world-renowned brand only because the brand changed its position. Now, this uh, the position was not changed because uh, of a, a, a situation uh, which had similarities with uh, the uh, XYZ brand, which is into food. Uh, this is a car brand, a Swedish car brand by the name of Volvo. We all know that. It's a, it's a great case study. And uh, what happened was uh, this car is uh, this car has been known uh, all along its existence uh, about the safety the measures uh, which the manufacturers uh, take while manufacturing uh, all their cars. And all their communications uh, over the last few decades, uh, as long as uh, I can recall and remember, all the communications uh, have been addressing the safety concern of customers. I mean, you have been, you might have looked at uh, the print ads um, and also television commercials in which the company showed kind of a framework uh, of steel, a kind of a cage, uh, which uh, uh, was the framework of um, a basic car. And uh, then um, it, they leave it to your imagination that uh, if you put something uh, on the front of the cage, that is the front side of the car, meaning the engine and all that, and if you put something on the back side, that becomes the back of the car, meaning the trunk, um, and uh, you know that's the total uh, structure. The basic idea of showing that um, strong and very solid steel framework was that if your car is hit in case of an accident, and that's what they showed, the front and the back, whichever side the car is hit from, those will buckle, but the frame inside is going to stay, stay intact, meaning there is no danger to your life. The car is so safe, and the car really was that safe. And people bought that because of that positioning. Now, this is not to say that the car did not have comfort. This is not to say that the car uh, did not have luxury. And this is not to say that the car did not perform well. The car had all the benefits. And those benefits got translated out of all the basic attributes which a very good car should have and do have and does have. From there on, God knows what struck the managers in that company. And they started thinking in terms of uh, repositioning their cars in terms of uh, their performance. And uh, they built up their communication uh, campaigns on the basis of performance because they thought other the models introduced by, I mean, produced by the Germans and Americans and Japanese are doing so well because they all talk about their performance or maybe they are positioned in terms of performance. So they started talking about the performance of that car. They changed the position and you can guess what happened. Sales declined. I mean, that is a real case study and it is a textbook example. So the point is, uh, one should be very sensitive. I mean, the business managers and brand managers and marketing managers in particular have got to be very, very sensitive to the shifts 
which have the potential uh, to change the basic positioning and basic positioning of any uh, the brand should not be um, the brought about the whimsically. Uh, they have to be brought about in line with what customers want, meaning in line with the customer's perspective. And that is what is meant by the positioning has got to be owned for the buyer customers. And that is what is meant by a positioning has got to be externally driven. With this example, I hope, and I am very confident that um, whatever I've talked about positioning so far is sort of very clear to you all. And uh, I will continue with my uh, lecture uh, on positioning uh, next time. Allah Hafiz until that time. And I look forward to seeing you.